Okay, so uh, I'm Zach Robertson, and I'm going to be presenting about diffusion limited aggregation. So you might not know what that means now, but by the end of this presentation, you certainly will. Okay, so what is diffusion limited aggregation? Well, it has three parts in it. You have diffusion, limited, and aggregation. The first word, diffusion, refers to how particles in a solution will randomly move around. For instance, if you put dye in a bucket of water, the dye will spread out through random motion and distribute itself evenly throughout the container. Dif limited. So this refers to the fact that we're only going to be looking at diffusion. It's, you're not going to be like shaking anything. You're not going to be having external forces. It's just going to be diffusion. So it's diffusion limited. Aggregation. So this refers to the fact that in some scenarios you have particles moving around and they stick together. They literally aggregate uh, somewhere and grow structure. So basically diffusion limited aggregation refers to particles that diffuse but also stick to each other. Okay, so what does it look like? Well, here are two examples that uh, I grew in the lab. And the one on the left is uh, grown in copper sulfate solution. So you have copper ions diffusing in your solution. And if you set up an electromagnetic field using a current, uh, you can knock around the molecules in the solution to create a diffusion of the copper ions. And when they hit the center potential, the they stick to it. So what you end up having is copper ions all glomming on to your uh, aggregate and basically growing your structure. So the two examples are different in one respect. The one on the left has, uh, it was grown at six volts and the one over here was grown at 14 volts. Okay, so this was supposed to be the time lapse of it, but uh, I'm supposed to play this now. Okay, so this is an example. You see how it's like growing out, mostly at the edge, the branch points? Uh, in a second, I'm about to turn up the voltage and it's going to grow pretty fast. Uh, that refers to the fact that you're knocking around the molecules a bit faster, so they're going to speed up. And at the very end, I turn it up one more time. And you see how like it's like more detailed branching at the end there? Okay, so Okay, so let's go back. Let's see. So <laughs> why why was it branching like that? Why doesn't it just grow like a solid disc? You know, uh, and there's a good reason for that. Uh, you have basically it starts out with a circle and the copper ions stick to that. So if you have a bump on this uh, circle, then you have more surface area here than on other parts of the circle per like length, basically. So if you have more uh, surface area per length, then what you're going to get is more particles glomming on to this newly created bump. And so you're going to get something that like kind of grows out, and uh, you're going to get maybe like multiple ones that grow out, but you're not going to get something that uh, fills them up because once you get some of these branches growing on. Uh, for a particle to start over here at the beginning of the branches, uh, it would have to go straight into the center, right, to fill it up. And that doesn't happen because that's like uh, flipping a coin and getting like, you know, 20 heads. You know, it's, it could happen, but it's not very likely. And think about uh, the, the motion that's like flipping a coin. If, you know, you can go up or, or to the right or down or, you know, so you can't really get multiple, you know, left up. You, it's like only one motion really gets you towards the center. So that's why it doesn't fill up. And that's why you get that cool branching structure. Okay, so it does look cool. And, uh, you know, in science, that's not really like the main objective. So we need to know kind of why might you want to uh, investigate DLA. And that's the abbreviation for diffusion limited aggregation. Okay, firstly, it's universal. And I'll explain that in a second. And secondly, it has ties to theoretical physics. Okay, so let's look at uh, universality. So what do all of these images have in common? Well, 
this one has branching structure, this one has branching structure, even this one has like, you know, detailed ice going on. And so you would say like, you know, they all have like a similar enough structure. They have this weird branching thing going on. And mathematically, what that's referred to as is universality. A DLA is effect mathematically the same as lightning or ice crystals for it. And this allows us to take analysis from this experiment and apply it to an experiment going on here. Like if you wanted to know about branching of lightning, then all you would need to know is what goes on the, with the branching here. And if, this is probably easier to investigate than you know, going out and trying to you know, count how many branches of lightning has. You know, it flashes pretty quickly. Okay, so there's also a connection between DLA and string theory. And uh, it's, it's kind of a little bit technical, but I can explain it here. You have, basically, DLA uh, has a center of mass when it's growing. It has like a, a, a balance point. And as it grows, this center of mass stays the same. And so basically, you have it growing out, but you know the center of mass isn't moving because it's like a wire stuck in there, and it's, it can't. And, but you also have the branches growing out. And so that's not constant. It, it changes as the DLA grows. But what's cool is that the, uh, the moments or the branching structure of the DLA is conserved. If you have branches growing out here at a fast rate, then the branches over here also have to grow out at the same rate because the uh, total symmetry of the DLA has to be conserved. Now, how's this related to string theory? Well, in string theory, there's a, a problem called the Toda hierarchy problem. And basically, this refers to the fact that uh, in string theory, you investigate more general objects called manifolds. They're basically surfaces, and you have strings on them oscillating. Well, in string theory, you want to know things about how many ways can the string oscillate. For instance, I can move my arm up and down, left or right, in and out. So that's like three degrees of freedom. Well, if I have something blocking my arm, I've effectively lost one of my degrees of freedom. Well, the total hierarchy problem tries to figure out just how many degrees of freedom we'll have if you know all the constraints that you'll have associated with uh, your oscillating object. So the relation here is how, uh, is basically that in DLA, you have branching patterns that each branch actually is considered a degree of freedom. So as you get an infinite number of branches, as you grow a really, really big DLA, this problem of determining like the conservation of moments in DLA effectively becomes the same as determining how a string oscillates on a mainland. <clears throat> so what was done here? We created a model for how DLA scales. And we also conducted an experiment to test our hypothesis, which was basically the mathematical theory of how we think it should work. So we have to take a slight diversion. Basically, we're investigating the scaling here. And for instance, how would you measure the length of a coastline? Well, you could use a meter stick, and you get one measurement. But if you use like you know half a meter stick, you get a longer measurement. And if you use something really tiny, you're going to like you know like go around buildings, and so you're going to get like a really long estimate. So basically, we're figuring out how does this length scale with uh, your measuring device. And then, for instance, like this one, this is like a line, but as like it gets more and more complicated, you can't really tell anymore that it's a line. And then this is actually how we did it. You have like little circles measuring basically the length of your DLA. Okay, so. I kind of explained some of uh, like what we're measuring, and to do this, you have like basically you set up like a pixel screen, and as you simplify the pixels, basically as you reduce the resolution, like you would with the photo, uh, you can still tell like what the photo was, but it's a lot easier to compress or manipulate on a computer, and mathematically it's a lot easier to analyze. So here is the experiment. You basically had two thin plates with the copper sulfate and the electric potential. And then as you turn the power on, it grew out. So here were the results. On the x-axis, you have the voltage. And on the uh, y-axis, you have 
uh, basically the scaling or fractal dimension of the object. You see that for low voltages, uh, you get pretty good agreement. And as you get higher and higher voltages, uh, the experiment fluctuates a lot from what we predicted. And basically, we can say that the model is really good for low voltages, but not so good for high voltages. More experiments need to be done to verify or disprove. And then uh, references. Yeah. <laughs>